We've been doing podcasts for 10 years at Slate, and we love them. Our audience loves them. Every writer at Slate wants to have a podcast, the few who don't already have them. And uh, I would simply say that as, as a journalist, um, I have never seen more intense user engagement around a medium than I have around podcasting. Uh, it's amazing. People will stand in, in the freezing rain to go to our live shows. They, if we put up a podcast an hour late, they call up to ask where it is. Uh, it's simply a, a very uh, personal, intense, uh, colloquial medium that people relate to in a, in a way that's unlike anything else. So you know, we're tremendously excited about the editorial possibilities and also about the business possibilities. I think Serial has created a kind of breakthrough. I mean, for us, it's been a steady build for a long time. We never gave up on them. A lot of places got excited about podcasts years ago, tried them, didn't have any immediate success, and, and dropped them. We've just been building them up. So we Slate now has more than a dozen of its own shows. We're doing six, seven million downloads a month, many more than we do with video. Uh, and so, you know, we sort of never gave up on it, but since Serial, people in the marketplace are excited about podcasts. People who didn't really understand what they were have figured out how to get them. And I think just the whole idea is resonating now in a way it wasn't a year ago. Slate was started in 1996. It was one of the first internet-only publications. And I think we've really, over time, taken our cues from the medium, from what's possible in the medium. The tone of internet journalism which I think in a lot of ways Slate was responsible for, really comes out of that interaction. You know, it's more personal, it's less formal, it uses humor without necessarily being comedy all the time, uh, uses first person a lot more, people are talking, it's a, it's a direct relationship with the reader, uh, which is different from what you have in print. Um, but the space Slate tries to occupy is sort of in between news and opinion, News really became a commodity with the internet, and opinion in a way became a commodity as well because there's so many voices telling you what they think. And Slate's always really tried to add value through analysis and explanation, and to do it in an engaging, interesting, you know, witty, often very witty way. And uh, it's a tone that's just developed over the years to the extent that when we hire young journalists out of college, they sort of know what Slate sounds like and how to do it. And they get to have their own voices, which is partly why they want to write for Slate. At the same time, you know, there's certain principles we live by. We don't waste the reader's time. We always want to be original. We always want to be adding value to what people can get through straight news sites or elsewhere. When our audience was mostly desktop based, I always set an arbitrary limit of a thousand words. I said people aren't happy reading things longer than that on, on their desks at work. Um, and I thought when mobile started to emerge that we were going to have to get shorter, figure out how to do really short form content because you think people were, would want little, little snippets, little nuggets of content. And in a way, uh, with mobile it's been the opposite. People or phones or iPhones are good and smartphones are good enough now that the portability is such an advantage that people will read, people will read War and Peace on an iPhone. I mean, it doesn't mean you should be long for the sake of being long, but it means that if something needs to be long, it's sort of more okay doing it now with mobile, surprisingly, than it was before mobile. I moved over from the editorial to the business side because I was so focused on this mission of figuring out how to make high quality editorial content, real journalism work as a business. And we've done it at Slate, although it took a long time. I think the challenge is, especially for legacy brands that still support big newsrooms and still have print publications, uh, you know, their cost structure is so much higher. And there's been a lot of progress made at a lot of different places, a lot of places that were in real jeopardy a few years ago, including New York Times, Washington Post, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The Financial Times. I think most of them have found ways to make their business work more or less. Uh, but very few of them are in clover right now. Very few of them have feel like they're, they've brought back the, the good old days. And I think it's still a challenge for the industry as a whole to figure out how it's going to support high quality content. Because, you know, without it, the internet's a lot of junk. Um, and, uh, you know, marketers need it and they don't necessarily want to pay for it. But figuring out how to support it, not just with advertising, that advertising is going to be the core of it, is a, is a problem that goes beyond just our industry. We've been doing uh, custom content, you know, since I think our first big project was 1999. The lingo has changed. Back then we talked about microsites, you know, but we were creating content uh, for marketers. And we have, uh, we have a content studio called Slate Custom 
uh, where we work with brands to create uh, content. It's separate from our editorial. We distinguish it clearly from editorial, but it performs when we do it well, when we're given the freedom to do it well. It performs very much like editorial content, even though everyone understands that it's commercial in nature. Um, so we really, we embrace it. Um, I, don't, I don't have any kind of fundamental problem with it. I think where you get into trouble is where people on either side want to blur the line. That's not in the reader's interest, it's not in the marketer's interest, and it's certainly not in the interests of publications.